Hey, all Friday the 12th, back at my office. It was quite the run. It was 11 days gone. Saw five airports, five different beds. Very interesting uh, time. In fact, somebody said to me, um, I think it was a member of my staff actually, asked to say, is it going to be good to be back in your own bed? Honestly, it's getting to a point where it doesn't feel like my own bed anymore just because I'm seeing so damn many of them. I'm not getting used to anything anymore. So it's the necessity that we have in today's environment. Why am I traveling so damn much? I'm a mortgage guy. I, I write loans. Why the hell should I be traveling like this? Well, we live in an environment right now where everybody's trying to get attention. Everybody's striving for attention. They're pushing, 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 pushing to get somebody to send business to them. It doesn't matter how damn good you are anymore. You got to be freaking visible. People forget about you. You don't have to be good at what you do to, to get business, apparently. You just have to show the hell up over and over and over again. And people are like, oh, I, I remember this person. They keep showing up. So I send them business. We also have people out there doing some dirty bullshit out there where they're literally sticking money under the table. That's going to come to an end and they're going to come crashing down hard. I hope they get their head held down to the damn curb because that's stupidity. That sucks. I put every single cent I've got back on the team to make us more efficient, make us more and more predictable and make sure that we get the damn deals done. But there's others out there that ain't and they're paying to get the business and those guys are getting more business. That sucks. That should stop. Now, can I stop it? No. I'm not, I don't know what to do about it other than just keep being the best there is. There's nobody that can't hold the candle with my team, period. There just ain't. Now, these guys are going to go out there and going to pay to get business because they're bitches. And then somebody else is going to give them to give it to them because the same damn explanation is how I see it. So I have to be out there. I'm going to continue to be out there, build relationships, make sure the friends that I've got out there, keep those relationships alive. It's my fault if I don't have that kind of relationship with them. So I'm going to make sure that I am earnestly going out there keeping the relationship strong, seeing people face to face and keep doing that. That's my role now. That's how I'm going to do it. That's how I'm going to keep doing it and keep talking to you guys, let you know what's going on out there. You got people pushing you to use somebody, have no idea who this sub bitch is and they suck over. They do walk away from that bastard. Get somebody you like that somebody get the job done. It's going to be, you can have confidence in. You got to go into these deals with confidence, not going to these deals like, mm, I'm sure this guy's okay, but they keep telling me to, no, have them tell you two, three people to talk to and pick the best one. Talk to all of them. Pick the one who, who you believe will get it done. Not the one who's the cheapest, not the one who, you know, that, that somebody's pushing you to use. If there's good reason, if they say, listen, this, this person understands what they've been doing, but they've been doing it for 20 some odd years. They got the best team in the industry. You pick for yourself. But let me just tell you, these guys are the best in the industry, not just, hey, we want to use this person, nobody else. Walk away from that crap. Don't listen to those guys. So um, what we had going on today, that's my rant, sorry. But that frustrates me when I get out there and we have done, worked our asses off to build the best there is, but yet somebody still can compete with me because I want to give some pay somebody. Screw that crap. I have no patience for this. Um, so inflation, CPI came out a little bit harder than what they expected, 0.37%, not, not, not a ton. So, you know, a little bit. But then also, if you look at um, some of the year over year inflation, it's declined 0.1%, which it was less than what they expected, right? Um so it did help us a bit. We're also, it's declined sharply. Their CPI, not real CPI, right? Their CPI has declined a lot from the 9.1% peak. Um, the producer price producer price index came out this week as well, and that it's increased. Uh, that inflation has increased a little bit. And it's still a little bit less than what they expected. They expect to be higher than that, but increased some, which shows that they, you know, but there's a year over year reading that's declining too. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of speculation why these year over years might be different because things are different than what they were a year ago. That pandemic is still involved. There's a lot of things that play into this. It's kind of hard to go back and look at that and try and compare it because the, the economy itself was so vastly different. So it's kind of hard a lot to it's it's difficult for us to be able to ascertain what the real outcome is of inflation and costs and all that when we have so much changing so rapidly within the economy and the economy is global. That makes a big difference, too. Uh, so let's take a look at the charts and see what's going on with mortgage-backed securities. That's also, you know, definitely a good thing for us to talk about. Definitely a good thing to look at. I went ahead and took some time. And I did some looking backwards. So I took some time and went looking backwards, did some research, um, and wanted to see exactly when did the Fed announce quantitative easing. Quantitative easing being when the market had taken its beating in 2008, the Fed is going to dump capital into the markets, 
to stimulate the economy, right? And the Fed took on, uh, you know, from, from what I understand, the Fed's portfolio by March of 2009, so starting at the end of 2008, by March of 2009, uh, the Fed's portfolio of securities had reached a record of $1.75 trillion, right? That was that. You know, they went into certain things. Uh, well, I'm not going to get into the details of how much they bought and where they bought it, but they announced quantitative easing, interestingly enough, November 25th, 2008. Now, I drew this line here, this yellow line, to represent where the market was the day they entered, the, the, the day they announced it. Right, the Fed announced quantitative easing one, so QE one, on November fifth, two thousand, uh, November twenty fifth, two thousand eight. This is where we sit right now. Literally, we bounced right off of that this morning. Find that very interesting. We bounced off of that particular level. Now, go all the way back. I'm gonna scroll you all the way back to two thousand eight here, right here. You can see I'm holding my cursor on it right there at the very bottom of my screen. Let's scroll down here so you can see it. Right where my cursor is, right there, November 25th, 2008. Look at where that starts. That's where they announced it. Money jumped in when the Fed announced that. So from this moment here on is all having to do with what the Fed had announced and where they played into the market. So all of this represents Fed's injection of capital as well as any other investment capital. And now it's this specific coupon. The reason I'm using this specific coupon, not the other coupons that may have seen less volatility in these areas here, because those coupons may have been the ones people may, were focusing their capital at. But go all the way over here. Now it's interesting. We see where we sit today. Uh, this represents here, uh, it, it, and I'm guessing on this line, this represents a line where uh, all the bottoms seem to hit most of the bottoms way back in 2008. So there's a, that's why I put this in there. See where we hit this bottom. Look, we hit this bottom uh, here. We come off of it. And I think this may represent a fairly strong bottom. I can't be certain on this, but this might be like the highest rates that we might see is in here. I hope if it is, that means our interest rates will probably peak out in the nines is what I'm guessing for real estate investors. That's my guess. If it stays at that is where our peak might be, this could be good. I'm hoping that I'm right there. I'm, But I don't, there's a possibility we're not. Because when we look at the way things are played out over the years, there's a good chance we can hit double digits. I don't think we're going back to 5% interest rates. Um, if you start following the 200-day moving average, everything keeps going downward with the 200-day moving average. We're getting squeezed right to this line where quantitative easing helped us stay above it for this entire time. Now, as a result of that, if we get below this and we are reasonably stay below it, I think we're going to keep playing with the 200-day moving average. We're going to bounce off that 200-day moving average. I believe we could work away below this line. When we do, that will make a significant ceiling. And we will keep bouncing off of that and keep working our way downward. If that's my anticipation, I hope I'm wrong. I pray I'm wrong. Because you follow this 200-day moving average that we cannot get con considerably above it for any length of time. So long as we've been above it, one, two, three, four, four days. We are now, right now, one day above it. Actually, we're two days. Right now, we're still above. We're bouncing right off of it. We're right now bouncing right off that 200-day moving average. So we're two days. Monday, Tuesday, if we get back down around it, again, it shows four days is our maximum time above that 200-day moving average. If that is the case, we work our way below this, we will continue to see that trend downward, this particular security trending downward, therefore interest rates trending upwards. As this goes down, the rates go up. That means money is leaving it. There's not enough money leaving, coming into it consistently. As they're using the money, they got to replenish it with more money. There's not enough consistent to replenish what's going out. And look at loans are down. We don't have as many being done as we used to. So that means that flow of capital is not, not as extreme as it should, as I see it. So here we have right here, this line I drew before. This is that really, really solid line. I believe that's going to keep us, we're, uh, we're not going to get above that. We haven't been able to get above it. See, we bang into it, bang into it and come back down. So we're going to be bouncing here with that 200-day moving average dragging us right down to this. That's where I believe. So mark this, 100.49. That goes all the way back to where the security priced at the day the Fed announced QE1. So just be careful on trying to climb the market and float this out. There ain't any lenders talking about this with you. They're telling you, oh, we're, you know, we can give you whatever loan right now and you can refinance later. I think they're full of shit. Not are they full of shit. They're also paying to be in front of you. Don't listen to these guys. They're paying to be in front of you. They're not bringing any value to you. I have put all my capital in my team to ensure that we bring value every single day. So they're not bringing you value. All they're doing is jerking you off with hope and of the future of something better. 
Hope it's not a business strategy. Don't get sucked into it. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate you subscribing, watching, all that kind of thing. I'll keep bringing you the best data I can, and we'll talk to you again soon.